A clear path forward requires looking back and learning. Good public policy requires human connection. It's a consideration of the facts, applying common sense and innovation. It's urban, it's rural, it's real life. We all have something to contribute. We all have a responsibility to get informed because there's a little piece of Canada in all of us, isn't there? Let's learn on this path together. This is Leaders on the Frontier. So with me here today to talk about Sir Johnny Macdonald, our first Prime Minister, a giant in our history, is uh, Dr. Patrice Dutille. And uh, it's wonderful to have uh, Patrice with us. He's a professor of uh, public administration and, and policy at Toronto Metropolitan University. And he joins us here today as also the author of Sir Johnny Macdonald at 200. Welcome, Patrice. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for having me. Well, it's an honor to have you, my friend, uh, Patrice. Um, we've had a number of conversations um, with, of course, a number of people, including Dr. Jerry Bowler, about uh, the importance of history in Canada. So yes. we thought we'd continue the theme, uh, given your uh, expertise on Sir John A. And uh, it's, it's, I love the book, uh, by the way, because um, I pretend to be um, a student of history, and, and it's amazing what we can learn about so many things about our, yes. our incredible country. And I, you know, what strikes me is that... Um, <clears throat> Sir John A. was, one thing that people maybe underestimate is that he was the Prime Minister for some 20 years. Uh, so his, his influence was massive in terms of kind of setting out the foundation and the trajectory and the course of our nation. So why, what, what made him so successful, if we had to summarize it uh, briefly, uh, Patrice? He was successful because he was able to convince people around him that his vision was uh, valid, that it was the correct vision for British North America. And he was able to convince people because he was true to his word. Johnny MacDonald was not only a great politician, he was also a remarkably able administrator. Mm -hmm. We forget that. Um, you know, setting up a government is very difficult. And setting up something like Canada, which was a combination of American federalism and British parliamentary structures, was was new territory. Mm -hmm. um, and so, he, you know, he wasn't alone. And I always want to emphasize that MacDonald was never alone. Um, there were people in Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, mm -hmm. Quebec, of course, Quebec, which was invaluable, Ontario, who were who were avid supporters of John A. and of his vision, but who also helped him helped him work the the difficulties of putting together a country like that mm -hmm. across. You know, again, this is 1867. It's across already time zones, although we don't know them as time zones yet. That'll come a mm -hmm. bit later. Um, yeah. There is very little infrastructure. There's a few harbors here and there. There's no railway connecting those four, four provinces. We, we, we have to remember now, it's not a question of coast to coast. We're talking 1864, mm -hmm. the first conversations to 1867, the birth of Confederation. We're talking about four provinces, Quebec, Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. PEI will come in later. British mm -hmm. Columbia will come in later. Manitoba, of course, uh, will be the first to join in 1870 through very difficult circumstances. But the point is, it's politics, but it's also administration. John A. Macdonald mm -hmm. comes in and he has already uh, an instinct that we have to focus on structures, that we have to create institutions that will be at once robust and yet at the same time flexible. So mm -hmm. as to accommodate, you know, we have to accommodate Nova Scotia. Nova, why do I say Nova Scotia? Because Nova Scotia voted against Confederation in 1867. They did not want Confederation. Nova Scotians mm -hmm. were quite happy uh, being part of the British Empire. They had great contacts in New England. Things were going well. They were happy that way. They voted against it. They voted against it. And they elected separatists, Joseph Howe, separatists <laughs> to the House of Commons. You think the, you think the Bloc Québécois is new? It's not new. We've had this all, all, our, all, all through our history. But John A. was able to convince people. And he did it because he worked really hard. It's something that I have emphasized time and again in my works. John A. Macdonald works 
like a dog and constantly. Oh. So Sir John A. was certainly a giant of a figure in Canadian history for those reasons. When you look at the, the chessboard, it was very complex. It was 1815, 1860. It's hard to imagine our country at that time. Yeah. So I want to just get into this a little bit more about uh, Sir John A. as a person. Um, can, we tell, can you tell us more, Patrice, about his story coming out of Scotland as a, as a young lad, uh, Presbyterian no less, as I recall, um, wh where did this man come from? He comes, it's, it's important, um, it's very important to remember the context. Uh, he comes out of, uh, he's born in 1815, so uh, literally a few months before Napoleon is finally defeated at Waterloo. Um, things in England are not going particularly well, things in Scotland not very well either. Uh, he's from a Highland family, the Clan MacDonald, and um, like many Nova Sc uh, sorry, like many, like many Scots, uh, the family decides to leave in 1820. So young John A. follows his father and mother, uh, comes to um, Ontario, uh, settles in the Kingston area, um, and part of a massive wave of Scottish refugees. These are the first refugees. So he was Canada. a refugee, no less. Oh, I think so. And this is Ken McGugan's point. This is not mine. Uh, mm -hmm. Ken McGugan, the, uh, the writer who's written so much about the Scottish inheritance uh, in Canada, it's a massive, it's a massive inheritance. I mean, mm -hmm. Canada, you could argue, I mean, Canada is run by Scots in those days, um, right through the 19th century. It's Scotland all the way. Mm -hmm. So you have to appreciate that. And I say this as a, as a proud French Canadian. <laughs> My grandmother was a Scottish, um, but um, they were very much part of that first wave um he moves to canada it's a a, a, a fairly ordinary childhood uh, in kingston goes to school uh will will finish high school so to speak uh, and immediately launches himself into uh legal studies with his uncle uh and you know in those days he didn't go to law school uh, johnny mcdonald had a hand in creating the law school in, mm -hmm. uh, in at queen's university um but and, and in fact would have a hand in creating post-secondary education in canada but now, in just, those days just, he didn't do that just okay. hold on for a sec so yeah. um i do remember this uh i i i did go to queen's university for some of my grad studies yeah. and uh so he had a real hand in the establishment of queen's university yeah. And this is the same Queen's University, and we'll get to this later, that yes. uh, took his uh, name off one of their grand halls. Anyways, it just yeah, it's true, and, and remarkable. Where most of the most of the uh, professors were very supportive of uh, tearing down the John A. Macdonald statue yeah. in uh, the, the 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 main city park in in Kingston. Yeah, yeah. just stunning, it's terrible. But regardless, I is it fair to say Macdonald really didn't have a childhood, a boy? Well, he's often said that, and. Uh, you know, but again, it's fairly typical of his day. Um, childhood is something we invented in the late 19th century. In those days, you were you were fed, and people were basically waiting to put you to work. Mm -hmm. You know, kids went to work um, all through 19th century Canada. Uh, you know, he had a, he suffered personal trauma. He saw his older brother being killed. Apparently, it's always been very. Um, mm -hmm. uh, cloudy that whole episode um was was that people, part of his the the um so-called confessions near the end of his life that no i'm not particularly no. aware of that but it's it's something that he 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 spoke about at not not at moments at moments i don't remember when it was exactly revealed to be honest with you but it's always been with him and people have pointed to that to help explain uh his um his alcoholism later mm. on um, and maybe that has, you know, again, maybe that has, that had an impact. Unfortunately, he's not Mackenzie King. He not, did not keep a diary. Mm -hmm. And, and you know, men in that period did not reveal that kind of stuff mm -hmm. about their past. You know, people have said that he suffered, he might have suffered from post-traumatic uh, stress syndrome. Uh, you know, it, it, it's, it's possible that, that that would have had an impact. But on the other hand, it doesn't seem to have affected his evolution. You know, he mm -hmm. joins the legal uh, world. Uh, he becomes a, a, a recognized lawyer in Kingston. Uh, he, businessmen like him a lot. He's very good at corporate affairs. Uh, he's also distinguished himself in, um, in criminal law, defending, famously defending uh, an American who had crossed the, uh, 
the St. Lawrence to attack Canada uh, in the 1837 rebellion. Uh, a guy called Schultz, uh, MacDonald defended him, but not successfully. The poor man was hanged. Um, but, you know, he was recognized as a lawyer. By the time he's in his early 30s, he's one mm-hmm. of the dominant lawyers in Kingston. Mm-hmm. And that is eventually parlayed into a political career. And, you know, next thing you know, he's in politics for almost 50 years. So It's really remarkable. So his, his political career was stunningly long at 50 years. Yeah. And um, he, what, what, what about his family life with, with his... Uh, his marriages and uh, really the tragedy of some of the deaths of his children. Yes, more tragedy, more tragedy. Again, uh, very typical of the 19th century. Um, He marries a a distant cousin. Uh, He goes back to Scotland in the 1840s. Um, That's something about MacDonald. He he went back to Scotland a lot. I mean, he's a very proud Canadian, very proud of, 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 of what he is. But at the same time, he never loses his attachment to Scotland and to Britain. And that'll affect our mm-hmm. politics. It'll affect our institutions at the same time. Um, but he goes back to uh, Scotland. He meets this cousin. Um, the, she returns the visit the, the next year. And so he gets married in 1843, as I recall, uh, the same year he launches his political career. Uh, and it's, uh, it's, it's, it's a happy marriage. There'll be a, a child born. Uh, that child, again, typical 19th century, will die. Uh, he has another boy, Hugh John, um, who will become eventually premier of, uh, of Manitoba uh, much later on, but only, and only briefly. Um, Hugh John is, is, a, is, is a, a healthy boy, but it will always cause serious heartache to McDonald. They, they fall out a lot mm. um, for reasons we could talk about maybe perhaps later, but Hugh John is more. Anyway, his wife um, dies 10 years later uh, following a, a chronic illness. And again, McDonald takes her to London. He takes her to New York City to try to find a solution to her ailments. It doesn't work. She dies in, at Christmas 1857, as I recall. Um, and after that, he'll spend 10 years as a bachelor raising Hugh John. Um, and again, having terrible fights with his son over all sorts of issues. Uh, when he's in London in 1867, he uh, reconnects with um, another young lady um, who's much younger than he is. By that time, he's in his he's 52 years old, and she's 31 years old. That's Agnes, um, uh, Agnes Hewitt. Uh, Agnes, Agnes Bernard, I'm sorry. Uh, and um, she's the sister of his deputy minister of justice. <laughs> but anyway, um, they fall in love. Uh, they get married uh, in February of 1867, so just before Confederation. Uh, Agnes, who knows Canada, she's been in Canada. They'd, she'd known Johnny MacDonald before. She, they get married in February 1867. Uh, Georges-Étienne Cartier is there. Uh, the whole gang, all the whole Canadian gang negotiating confederation mm-hmm. is there. And uh, she'll move back to Canada a few months later, and she'll be the wife of the prime minister for the rest of, uh, you know, for the rest of the century. Mm-hmm. Um, they have a child, uh, Margaret Mary, a few years later. Unfortunately, this uh, young, this baby is born with uh, hydrocephaly. Uh, she is uh, gravely uh, ill. Uh, she'll never walk. Uh, mm, she will be uh, mentally impaired for all her life. She'll live a long life. Uh, she won't die until the 1920s, which is, again, remarkable uh, for a person born mm-hmm. with that kind of condition uh, in the late 1860s. Uh, testimony to the great care uh, that she was given and uh, to the support that she was given all through mm. her life by her father and her mother. You know, Johnny McDonald loved her to death. Um, it was a special moment for him to, uh, uh, to have her. And, you know, she wrote letters now and then. And wow. it was very affectionate. It's all very affectionate. All this to say that John A. had um, a, often a troubled personal life, uh, but he took it uh, in good cheer. Um, you know, he was, he was <clears throat> an, an impressive man that way. Mm-hmm. Uh, and of course, sometimes it took, you know, it, it took its expression in, in the, the stress of that kind of life took expression in his alcoholism. He did mm-hmm. drink uh, to excess. It made his reputation, unfortunately. Um, he drank to excess. And uh, 
for a long time, for a very long time. Uh, but he sort of dried up uh, starting in the um, mid 1870s. He starts to dry up uh, because he comes to Toronto uh, and Toronto has that effect on people. He <laughs> meets a right? lot of people in Toronto. He meets a <clears> lot <throat> of people in Toronto and um, he, um, he dries up and you'll, you won't, he'll keep drinking, but you won't hear any more stories mm -hmm. of, of the kind of, you know, the kind of, drunken uh extended drunken periods mm -hmm. that he had in the 1850s and 1860s mm -hmm. um even into the early 70s mm -hmm. so i mean yeah he drank he drank like everybody else drank mm -hmm. you know we, yeah we, we had a movement in north america and canada the women's christian temperance union that was a massive lobby group probably the most important lobby group uh in canada at the time um, mostly led by women but a lot of men are involved in that also mm -hmm. I mean, you can't dismiss the 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 men in there and their task was to reduce the number of bars and to reduce the reduction the the consumption of alcohol and uh you know to force politics to to uh, achieve that objective to, to yeah. reduce alcohol so i mean it um it mattered a great deal mm -hmm. so you're um you know, obviously uh, trained as a, a historian, you've yes. written extensively about Sir John A. Um, it, it, it's sometimes hard to evaluate someone who has been in political uh, life for some 50 years, who lived a long life. Would it yeah. be fair to say that Sir John A. Macdonald was a complex person? Oh, sure. Of course. I think that oh, it goes without a doubt. Um, very very complex and his achievements were complex mm -hmm. uh mm -hmm. you know we're all complex you're complex i'm complex but uh we don't translate all these all these contradictions that we have mm -hmm. and our our manners of accommodating mm -hmm. all those contradictions right. into in, you know into a personal success a political success he managed all that i think that's what makes him all the more interesting mm -hmm. um, but 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 clearly this is part of the challenge of doing history is that we're dealing with uh what are called human beings. They have complexity. Yes. Uh, we, they're not two-dimensional props. Uh, yes. But in this case, it's clear to say that Sir John A. Macdonald played a central role in the creation of this country. So I want to just briefly, uh, quickly highlight those accomplishments because obviously he played, he didn't play checkers. He played three-dimensional chess. Yes. Because uh, if you know anything about Sir John A. Macdonald and the establishment yes. of history, the, the cast of characters is just stunning, both yeah. domestically and internationally. So what would you say are his key accomplishments? Well, I, uh, without a doubt, without a doubt, uh, Confederation, convincing people to support Confederation, mm -hmm. um, running that first campaign in this, uh, August and September of 1867 um, and winning that, that campaign legitimizing the project of creating a country i think that's without a doubt uh his first his first monument mm -hmm. and for that alone for that alone i think he merits uh every every plot it uh possible i mean he, he okay. deserves the praise for that all right then so again, i'm he, he, go ahead. i'm gonna ask you then a a straight up question then yeah would canada exist if it weren't for a guy named sir john a Macdonald? It probably would. Again, I would emphasize that John A. is um, is very much a man who works with others. He's not, you know, he's often accused of being a dictator. Um, he wasn't. He always worked with others. Mm -hmm. But he he was able. He's one of those guys. He's always a keystone. He's a keystone. He's the guy that makes the thing hang together. Mm -hmm. A lot of people in Ontario wanted to see a Canada coast to coast. George Brown wanted to see a Canada coast to coast. Um, you know, uh, even people in the Maritimes, some people in the Maritimes wanted to see a Canada coast to coast. Why? Because it made sense. It would make sense economically if you could develop the West. It could make sense, especially in defense of the Americans. Mm -hmm. If you had an ambition to keep North America British, well, you had to keep it protected from the American Republicans. Uh, that was, for a lot of these people, key. What goes, what makes McDonald different is that he's able to forge those coalitions. He's able mm -hmm. to speak to the, let's say it, I mean, the, the French Canadians, the Quebecois, yeah. to convince them that Canada was worth a shot, that Canada, with its federal structure, but with a strong central government, 
would avoid the excesses of the American Republic, the secessionism of the American Republic, by giving the provinces the flexibility to organize themselves uh, in a manner that was consistent with their political culture. So mm -hmm. people like Georges Etienne Cartier, for example, will, will openly defend the Confederation project by saying that we in Quebec will have control over our destiny, that we will be able to uh, maintain our French heritage, our Catholic heritage in a Protestant country. We are joining a Protestant majority, but within that Protestant <clears throat> majority, we'll be able to uh, maintain ourselves and grow within this uh, mm -hmm. this new entity. We will benefit from the defense, the joint defense of Canada. And so McDonald, make, see, no, nobody else could do that. George Brown could not get along with the French Canadians. He could not mm -hmm. get along with, yeah. he didn't like Catholics. Uh, and Catholics, I mean, 40% of the population is Catholic um, in, in those days. So, I mean, it's, 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 it's that ability to talk. It's that ability to get along with the Irish, mm -hmm. to respect the Irish, uh, to respect the indigenous people, to, it's, it, it, it's, to respect women. I mean, mm -hmm. John A. Macdonald will reveal himself to be something of a feminist when in 1885, he proposes in the House of Commons that women be given the right to vote, mm -hmm. that indigenous people be given the right to vote. That's also, revolutionary. Also blacks. Oh, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Anybody, anybody, yeah. except, well, and if we get into another story here, uh, which is ex with the exception of Chinese um, mm -hmm. uh, people, because at that time in 1885 there is an <clears throat> sorry there's an enormous um there's a swelling of opinion in in the in the west in in british columbia in particular but also in in the united states um that the chinese uh population is now a threat to the country it's become too large and um and and that was because uh, of the as i recall the civil war that was happening in china i think there was well, Tens there's of the millions long, that died. Yeah, the Taiping, were, yeah, well, yeah, yeah it's a product yeah. of the Taiping Rebellion. But the, you know, the fact is that the the, the Chinese international migration um, is 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 um, is an important phenomenon. Mm -hmm. We in Canada had attracted Chinese migrants in order to build the CPR. Mm -hmm. uh, it was vital. They had been vital uh, in the American building of the uh, transcontinental 20 years earlier. Mm -hmm. They came to Canada <clears throat> to to do the same thing, uh, and and. You know, even though 600 Chinese workers, we estimate about 600 Chinese workers died building the wow. CPR, which is a dramatically, I mean, that's a high number. It's a terrible, terrible. number. Um, McDonald, uh, in order to gain support for uh, his, his wish to give women and indigenous people the right to vote, had to compromise. Uh, he wasn't happy about it. Uh, he did it. He did it. He also imposed uh, 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 an entrance tax. Uh, what became a head tax on Chinese migrants? He didn't. He didn't stop Chinese immigration. The Americans mm -hmm. had stopped it flat. We didn't stop. Johnny did not stop it, but he put an entrance tax on mm -hmm. on Chinese migrants, and uh, that that of course has has harmed his reputation enormously. Yeah, but, but but to be clear, yeah. Canada at that time, as it was emerging as a country, was a mere four million people, as I recall. Yeah, and left. so yeah. they were very, very concerned about how do you maintain uh, a decidedly British dual culture yeah. with the French. Yeah. So it was not an easy task to maintain that, and and so I I think I might quibble with your point, Patrice. That I I'm not sure from my own perspective, and I and and who am I to argue with with you? that Canada would exist without Sir John A. Macdonald. I don't know who else could have come forward. I, and I, I again, we're, we're in the land of speculation here. Um, it would have been very difficult because I guess he had that indispensable uh, set of skills, uh, to borrow that expression, a particular set of skills that uh, allowed Canada to survive those very, very difficult years. Yeah. Again, the challenge from Nova Scotia, the challenge from Manitoba, uh, the challenge of building a CPR in order to keep British Columbia mm -hmm. in Confederation. These are massive projects. Huge, because British Columbia said, we're not going to join Confederation. Yeah. You're not going to have that vision of a coast-to-coast -coast country unless you build that CPR. Yeah. You also had the challenge of the British aristocrats. Uh -huh. And 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 the the myriad of negotiations they had he had to pull off with that group and he did it he did so miraculously 
also within the background, is this not correct, of um, uh, uh, an incredible uh, emerging power, the United States, with a standing army that could have marched into Canada within a week or two. Oh, is this, am, am I yeah. overstating this? Uh, no, no. I mean, uh, again, I think um, through his diplomacy, MacDonald was able to create uh, a new angle in the relationship between Britain and the United States. The American Civil War in all this is critical. Uh, it's not an accident that the movement to um, create Canada in 1864, 65, 66, 67 uh, takes place against the backdrop of the American Revolution, American mm -hmm. Civil War. Um, the first ideas of Confederation had been had been launched in 1858, but had pretty well died. It's with a civil war, and again, the, the situation is complex because Britain supported the Confederates. Mm -hmm. For some strange reason, in order to protect the cotton uh, trade, yeah. the, Ameri the the British had supported the South. I mean, talk mm -hmm. about being short-sighted. Uh, Canadians felt as though they had to follow the British lead. And those people who really felt British in Canada, people like Joseph Howe, people like a lot mm -hmm. of the Nova Scotians, mm -hmm. had a strong attachment by, you know, by some strange relationship through Britain to the South. Mm -hmm. Johnny's not like that. I mean, he, 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 he never displayed any particular affection for the South or for its designs. Not, not at all. But um, what, what, what the point is, though, is that after the war, Britain wants to repair its relationship with Washington. And uh, there's a convention, there's a conference called in Washington in 1871 to see if things can be repaired between Gen you know, President Grant, Ulysses Grant, and, mm -hmm. and the British government. And MacDonald is invited because you know Canada is going to be the issue. The um, United States says, okay, Britain, if you want to be friends, give us Canada. Mm -hmm. No. <laughs> so, I mean, that's not going to happen. Johnny McDonald mm -hmm. comes in and, you know, he, he'll he participate for two months in 1871 at a conference in, in, in Washington and we'll establish Canada. Again, we'll defend Canada and convince, convince the United States that this is not a passing interest, that exactly. there is in Canada something that has taken root and that it is by and large acceptable to the United States that what is going to take place in Canada is going to be a moderate experiment in governance where people are peaceful and where no harm to the U.S. Uh, will be generated. Mm -hmm. that, that's an important part. It's part of a slow cultural awareness of uh, a land building north of their borders that will not be troubled as opposed to Mexico. Exactly. I mean, already the Americans are very, very concerned mm -hmm. about what the heck is happening in Mexico. And they're very fearful mm -hmm. of whatever developments uh, yeah. might emerge there that might harm them. McDonald creates that North Atlantic triangle. He establishes Canada in the minds of Britain and of the United States right. that there is a third concern here and uh, that it has to be respected. And so, he will do that for the rest of his life, time and again, you know, John A. Macdonald wants a free trade agreement. He wants free. He's a he's a liberal, small L liberal. He wants free trade. He wants trade with the United States. The Americans shut him down. They don't want free trade. They don't like the British. They don't want free trade. And uh, as a result, Macdonald will launch the national policy in 1878. High tariffs, uh, protection for Canadian industry, protection for Ontario and Quebec industry as you Westerners like to say. Uh, and and, and uh, that included also, of course, uh, redoubling efforts to build a railroad because it did not work in 1870. I mean, the experiment, uh, the first experiment of the CPR uh, to fulfill the promise to British Columbia comes to a failure. Uh, it doesn't work. Alexander Mackenzie, the other Scotsman immigrant who comes to Canada and who becomes prime minister uh, for a, sh a short five years uh, in the 1870s, does not see much merit in the CPR. He can't afford it. He doesn't have the vision. He doesn't have mm -hmm. that ambition to build that McDonald have. McDonald has. McDonald comes back in 1878, roars to power, and you know launches himself into the CPR, convinces American capitalists, convinces British capitalists to fund the CPR. He'll throw in his own money. I'm talking about the government of Canada money, lots of promises to the CPR in terms of land grants and stuff like that. He gets it done. He gets it done. And in five years time, the CPR is completed. A okay, remarkable so, accomplishment. So, so to be clear, 
beyond the founding of Confederation of Canada, creating this Canada, was the accomplishment of building uh, the Canadian Pacific Railway from coast to coast. It's, it's hard to fathom this this day because um, railways uh, were coming into their own, uh, obviously, at that time. But it was a visionary project. If you know anything about Canada's geography, I can't imagine, uh, as someone who likes to chop wood, I can't imagine uh, building a railway across this country at that time. It's just, it's just hard to wrap your head around that. So was he really the primary driver behind the vision of building that railway from coast to coast? Without a doubt, without a doubt. Um, time and again, the CPR runs into trouble, technical trouble. They have grave difficulties with building and, uh, you know, across the across the uh, the Rockies, mm-hmm. um, but also, um, you know, through Northern Ontario, uh, money runs out. Um, they have to appeal to the government of Canada, and they get a hard hearing. You know, they get a hard hearing. The cabinet is not is not happy with the amount of money um, that is required to build this thing, and. Um, it comes back to McDonald and, uh, you know, the knocks at his door and it, finally it's his decision. Yeah. You know, and he, again, he convinces his cabinet that this is worth doing. You know, at some point he gets into the, into the weeds, you know, to get the support of Quebec, they're going to have to put an extension to Quebec city and to put a, an extension to the Trois Rivières. Mm-hmm. He, man, you know, he, he'll, he'll, he'll endure the headaches of of you know of doing this just just imagine you know the troubles that we're having today with the um the gas pipelines in the west you know um with all the the abilities we have today the engineering abilities we have today it's still heavy politics Mm -hmm. and it's a politics that has made it very difficult for um the Harper government, the Trudeau government, the, the, the government that will succeed the Trudeau uh, government. It's, these are hard things. These are hard things. And McDonald mm-hmm. managed. And again, the, the, the CPR was built within you know five years. Pretty remarkable. It really is. So as we look at Sir John A. McDonald, and I know that we're getting into a little bit of a, a, a funny realm here of speculation, but my, my thesis here and I, I'm asking you whether you'd support it, is that Sir John A. Macdonald really did play three-dimensional chess. As he maneuvered his international relationships with the British, he got the financiers lined up in London to finance the transnational railway. He brought together both French and British traditions with the English. He worked collaboratively with Indigenous leaders to set up treaties before the CPR went in those lands. He he, he, he thread the needle of creating a country called the British North America. And if it wasn't for him, is it fair to say we'd all be part of the United States? Oh, I think so. I mean, I, yeah. I mean, I, I think that is creating those structures that will support Canada through those hard years uh, was essential. Creating a political system, a political culture. John A. Macdonald was very much about moderation you know he always considered himself a liberal conservative he never ran on a conservative ticket he was a liberal conservative mm-hmm. um, a lot of people thought he was a bit of a lefty <laughs> he wasn't but you know uh, but he was always willing to put he was always uh, willing to put some water in his wine to get that compromise to get things moving so yeah I mean it's 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 uh, you know as I say he never worked alone but he's that keystone he's always that keystone that makes the thing hang together. Okay, so let's uh, talk about his relationship with Indigenous communities. Yep. Is there a way to summarize that up? And then I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, a gentleman by the name of Louis Riel. Yes. By and large, the relationship between John A. Macdonald and the Indigenous population is a positive and friendly one, it's something that's been overlooked completely. Um, yes, John A. Macdonald uh, decided, well, he decided to negotiate the first treaty, the first numbered treaties uh, with the uh, Prairie Indigenous people in uh, the late 1860s. And he'll sign a couple of them in the 1870s, early 1870s, but most of them will be signed by the Alexander Mackenzie government, the Liberal government, uh, through the mid-1870s. Um, those things were in part imposed by precedent because we Canadians had negotiated arrangements 
uh, had renegotiated uh, reserves in Eastern Canada and all the provinces of Eastern Canada. So we were part of that tradition. Um, Britain insisted that Canada negotiate with the Indigenous people, about 20,000 people in Western Canada, uh, to have the same kind of accommodation. And the Indigenous population also wanted it. Mm -hmm. They wanted to have some guarantees. And with the years, the treaty, the number of treaties uh, involve um, a give and take. Um, there will be massive amounts of land set aside for these 20,000 people. Uh, in exchange, the government will also provide them with money. Uh, there are provisions for medicines. There are provisions for education. Uh, mo again, I emphasize, most of those treaties were not signed by MacDonald, although he set the precedent in the early 1870s, and he will have to live up to them uh, through the 18, uh, late 1870s when he's returned to power and the 1880s. By and large, very friendly relationship with the indigenous people. Uh, that has to be remembered. And he cared about him. He cared about them immensely. He wanted them involved in the mainstream. He wanted them involved in, in, in politics. Uh, I mean, of course, the liberals are outraged by that. Um, but he wanted that. And that's an important aspect of his legacy that mm -hmm. uh, just cannot be forgotten. And, and why was the outrage by, by the opposition at that time? They Good. simply did not see the Indigenous people as equals. Mm. They did not want to see Canada's politics affected by that mm -hmm. presence. Um, they did not think that it was uh, important. I mean, they were very much of the view, and this is a view that's widely shared in 19th century Canada, that the Indigenous population is in decline mm -hmm. uh, and that it has no future on its own. The only way uh, those communities are going to survive is if they learn the ways of capitalism, of self-sufficiency, uh, of, of agriculture, mm -hmm. uh, which is exactly what they did in Eastern Canada. I mean, in Quebec and Ontario, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia, PEI, all those communities become farmers. They are farmers. They grow mm -hmm. stuff. Mm -hmm. In the West, it's very difficult. You have a completely different mindset. You have a mindset that is set uh, by the hunt for the buffalo. And uh, that transition to uh, a sedentary life, uh, an agricultural life, is a shock to the system. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, you, you, we, we cannot imagine a greater shock. I mean, to live for 10,000 years by the rhythm of the buffalo mm -hmm. and to suddenly be told by government and by the realities, because the, the buffalo is disappearing literally mm -hmm. overnight. It's been the, the billions, the, yeah, I think, well, let's say many, many, many millions of buffalo mm -hmm. that had roamed the prairies have gone, have disappeared. Yeah. It's gone. You can't live off the buffalo anymore. You have to settle and you have to do this now. You have exactly. to do it now. You can't. And, you can't do it anymore. And so the Americans within, won't let you. The Americans won't let you across the border. That that yeah. border is firmed. That's right. And and so within that tragedy of the 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 disappearance of the bison, uh, there was star great starvation. And can you tell yes. us about the McDonald's role in in helping Indigenous people uh, survive that terrible time? There was there was there was starvation. People did go hungry um, because there's no buffalo. Um, Johnny McDonald returns to power in 1878 and uh, takes this very seriously. Uh, he will create a program of, um, of training for the Indigenous communities. He will send uh, inst farmer instructors. He will set up model farms. He will create a program to provide rations. Again, it's important to remember the context. This is the late 1870s, the early 1880s. There is no railway. There is exactly. no refrigeration. Yeah. Uh, there, is, there is no road. <laughs> you have to go through the United States. You have to purchase food stocks mm -hmm. from the United States. So, uh, so, but to be clear, this was a massive food uh, safety yes. relief operation. One yes, of the largest absolutely. in our history that saved tens of thousands of Indigenous people. Arguably, I mean, uh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, they, 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 this is a reality, and and it, it became it became the largest program uh, for the for the Canadian government uh, after after uh, transfers to the provinces and after pu the public um, public works and and railways. It's the third mm -hmm. largest expense. Wow. It's an enormous investment of 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 government funds at a time when there are no social programs. Mm -hmm. There are no social programs in Victoria and Canada. 
It's very important to remember that. On top of that, McDonald will provide uh, inoculation for Indigenous people um, when there's a big wave it, of- and, and that was smallpox. Uh, smallpox that was smallpox. In 1885, yeah. uh, the Indigenous population will not be affected. Uh, again, you know, many lives were saved as a result of Johnny McDonald's interventions. He had some foresight and he cared. So the idea that McDonald was genocidal or that he did not respect the indigenous people, or that he was uh, racist towards them, simply mm -hmm. doesn't hold water. Well, the, it's, the, the it's, facts of the case are fundamentally different. Yeah, it's it's frankly slanderous of, of our first prime minister. Yeah. So in this context as well, let's talk about Louis Riel. Uh, he's also a complex uh, leader in our history, certainly um, one of our, our founding leaders. Um, and uh, Métis, and, and uh, really quite a, an incredible story, uh, whether, whether he was a martyr or, or insane. Um, so what was the relationship between MacDonald and Louis Riel? How do you summarize that one? Well, let's just say real tension. <laughs> Johnny MacDonald, uh, Louis Riel first comes up uh, in 1869 as a topic because he will lead the resistance in the Red River settlement. Yep. Right. Um, the CPR has been announced. The, the sale of Rupert Lands has been announced. Uh, and uh, Louis Riel rallies the Métis, the French-speaking, what they called mixed blood in those yes. days. Mm -hmm. uh, these are the, the, the products of a community of indigenous people and the, uh, the settler whites in the West mm -hmm. who, are, who are merging, who are creating families on their own and who are creating a new culture on their own. The Courier uh, de Bois. Sorry? The Courier de Bois. Courier, uh, Courier de Bois, yes. The, 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 yeah, the, very much the legacy of the Courier de Bois. Um, so Riel leads the first rebellion in 1870. Uh, that's settled militarily, so to speak, in the sense that Canada, the government of Canada will not recognize, will not recognize a competing uh, government uh, in the West. It has to be established by the crown. It has to be established, you know, by 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 fiat from the government. It can't be something that just comes out of the ground. So um, the Manitoba Act is passed. Louis Riel uh, will will stay in Canada for a while, and eventually, um, you know, he's committed uh, to a, an asylum. He has a mental breakdown. He eventually finds his way in the United States, gets married there, uh, sets himself up as a school teacher, lives modestly, but you know, he he becomes an American citizen. In fact. Um, the the uh, Métis community, uh, which has moved from Manitoba to uh, Saskatchewan on the Saskatchewan River, um, hails him, uh, wants him back uh, to lead the community uh, again as um, the government of Canada surveys the land up on the on the North uh, Saskatchewan River, and there is there is a, a fear of of um, of a misunderstanding about how those lands will be surveyed. Mm -hmm. McDonald, I'll make the case as many others have before me that McDonald's, uh, the McDonald government was guilty of being slow. Uh, again, again, let's remember that surveying land at that scale in the 1880s is not an easy task. No. It takes a lot of time to do it. So they, it they didn't, fast enough. they didn't have GPS no. surveys and lasers <laughs> at that time. Is that right? Exactly. It takes a lot of time and there were disputes. I mean, the, the indigenous, the, the, the Métis wanted uh, river lots, mm -hmm. the British, you know, trained English Canadian surveyors wanted square blocks. There was accommodation happening, but it was too slow. Mm -hmm. And the Métis community I should say, I mean, it's not the Métis community, a small portion of the Métis community were upset by the slow evolution mm -hmm. of that surveying. Right. And they raised their arms. They, 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 they attacked government officers, the, uh, the RCMP. A few Cree indigenous people joined them, a few only a small few, the vast majority of indigenous communities supported the crown, supported the government of, of John A. Macdonald. And of, and of course, an armed insurrection breaks out, people are killed. Louis Riel is brought to trial and he is found guilty of treason. Um, he will uh, win appeals. 
um, he will he will seek appeals. He will lose all his appeals, and the decision winds up um, at John A. Macdonald. Will he recommend mercy? Uh, John A. Macdonald did not like Louis Riel. Uh, he regretted Louis Riel's return. He especially did not like the idea of Louis Riel um, fomenting um, fomenting uh, dissent among a few indigenous people. He feared that there would be uh, a greater movement against the uh, Canadian government. And again, you know, McDonald is always looking at the United States. He mm-hmm. sees what has happened in the United States when the um, the American army, the American army is at war with indigenous people where there mm-hmm. are, you know, probably millions of people being killed. McDonald is horrified by what the Republic has done. He doesn't want any of that. And he takes pride in being uh, a man of, of of peace, where he has achieved peace at minimal cost. I mean, the RCMP is very, very small. It's it's trivial. And, and, when you and, think of the scale of the West, it's a trivial force. Yeah, and and the RCMP, to be clear, was founded why? Well, it was created. It was called the Northwest Mounted Police. I shouldn't call it the RCMP. Mm-hmm. It's the NWMP, Northwest Mounted Police, uh, and it was created to to bring peace to 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 arbitrate it was not an army it was a police force this is fundamental it was a police force not an army the americans sent the army mm-hmm. johnny mcdonald sends the police he was he had the ambition of creating uh, uh, a police force that would be uh inclusive of metis people that would have indigenous people part of the northwest mounted police so i mean his view his ambition which I think is 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 very much emblematic of the Canadian spirit that mm-hmm. he incarnated already. Um, what was of a view of, of of maintaining peace, order, and good government? Right. Something we all aspire to. And, now, and to be again, clear, did he did he succeed? That's the question. Yeah. I mean, were there flaws? Go ahead. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm talking no, no. Too I, much I, I guess ahead. what I'm I'm getting at, uh, uh, Patrice, is that he had with his government a very different, contrasting vision of oh, yeah. settling this huge continent in contrast to the United States. Yeah. If you look at the founding of the RCMP, it was to establish law and order as a police function, as you say, not a military function, not the army. And it was also designed to uphold the protection of the rights of all its citizens, including indigenous Canadians. Yeah, yeah for, exactly. Now again, did he succeed? No. The, the, the reality is that there are very few Indigenous people who are willing to join a Northwest Mounted Police. There is no doubt that there was a lot of prejudice among the members of the Northwest mm-hmm. Mounted Police who did no not doubt. want to have anything to do with the yeah. Indigenous people. Did the uh, farmer instructors work? <clears throat> a lot of them did. A lot of them did not. Was there enough money sent to, um, to, uh, to famine relief? There's a lot of evidence that they, that they did not. It's very hard to deliver foodstuffs to the West in the 1880s. It's very mm-hmm. difficult. And stuff rotted. There was never enough. Um, some people died. It's, it's undeniable. Some people died. Yeah. And Johnny McDonald was criticized in his day for that. Mm-hmm. But those are failures of program. They're not failures of intention. They're not failures of ambition. Mm-hmm. And I think it's an important consideration to remember that he tried. He tried. Did he succeed, succeed across the line? No, no, I can't say that. But he tried, which is a lot more than what the liberals did in their day um, when when they were in government. Mm-hmm. So, I mean, on, on, on that front, I think McDonald deserves praise. I think McDonald serves to us as a shining example of what government should be able to do. As we get to the the last part of our, our discussion here, Patrice, um, let's just reflect on when McDonald kind of wrapped up his time in office, he was very, very popular. I think uh, his last election, he got, as I recall, 48% of the, the popular vote, which is really quite stunning. So why was he so popular? Is there a short, brief response to to that answer? I think, well, there's a couple of reasons, and, I, and you're, you're, you're quite right to point that out. And, and I will even point out that even in Quebec, in Quebec, after the hanging of Louis Riel, uh, in the election of 1887, mm-hmm. and again in the election of 1891, facing Wilfrid Laurier, no mm-hmm. less, all right, the the son the of the land of Quebec. The formidable Johnny Laurier. Johnny McDonald picked up 50% of the vote in Quebec. Wow. 
that tells you a lot about and, and, and you know and Quebec had no real reason to vote for John A because <laughs> Quebec at the same time is being depleted of probably you know historians estimate anywhere between a quarter and a third of its population because there's not enough jobs the farms are hard are hard uh, to, 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 to maintain. The land in Quebec is rocky. And meanwhile, there are lots of jobs in, in New England. And people are moving to New England by droves, in droves, in Massachusetts, in Rhode Island, uh, they're Pennsylvania. They're moving. They're Maine, Maine. I mean, a, a huge portion of my family uh, lives in Maine, I discovered. Hmm. Uh, people of my family name. Um, and they did not return. So under McDonald, Quebec loses a massive amount of its population. And yet, and yet they vote for him. Mm -hmm. And yet, even faced with Wilfrid Laurier, they they vote for, for McDonald. So that is a huge testament to his popularity. Uh, yeah, he wins. Why does he win? Because again, he's, he's able to convince people that uh, he's the right man for the job. He has the right vision for the country, and he works so hard mm -hmm. to make it happen. He works like a dog to make it happen. You know, when he dies, there is going to be a, a, a an enormous procession. There will be statues um, erected in his honor in Montreal. This is within three years of his death. In Montreal, in Kingston, in Toronto, and in Hamilton, four important statues. There will be eventually a, a, a fifth one in Ottawa, but that'll take a long time uh, to be to be put up. Um, those four were paid for by subscribers, not government money. Wow. When they were all unveiled, anywhere between 10 and 20,000 people attended the unveiling. Prime ministers gave speeches in honor of John A. Macdonald. People attended, people paid for it. And those statues have all come down, with the exception of the one at Queen's Park that uh, is protected 24 seven by police. In Hamilton, in Kingston, in Montreal, all the statues have come down. These are statues that were paid for by our forefathers who attended in droves the unveiling of those monuments those monuments were taken down by a few dozen what do you call them <laughs> you know hooligans and what's worse is that our governments have supported them uh we got the sad news uh in the uh in the fall of last year in the fall of 2023 that the McDonald statue in Montreal would not be reestablished, mm -hmm. um, and uh, all sorts of allegations as to why, which are false, completely false, completely wrong-minded, um, ignoring the context and ignoring the accomplishments that we've discussed over the last hour. Um, but it's the trend now, and uh, John and McDonald, the champion of 19th century nationalism, of, of an idea of Canada, is no longer considered to be suitable as a role model for our society, our, our very perfect 21st century society. So to be clear, why is this so-called trend happening? I say, quote, trend, because I would say that it's informed, it's not an informed opinion, it's, it's an ignorant um, uh, trend. Uh, it's not based on fact or evidence. In fact, the, the, the facts and evidence, we, we should, as Canadians, take heart and be proud yes. of our first prime minister and his remarkable vision and achievement to give birth to this incredible country. And no, it was not perfect, but it is an incredible country. And it strikes me that now more than ever, we need to know the history of our first prime minister and that incredible legacy. And the question I have then is, why is this happening? Why are we not teaching history in our schools? Or do we have politicians who have no backbone, who don't know their history, and somehow do not understand that this is an attack not only on Sir John A. Macdonald, but on every self-respecting Canadian? Well, it's a combination of that. Um, we, we do not study Johnny McDonald. Johnny McDonald is, uh, is not a uh, subject of, um, of discovery for our students. Um, 
you get uh, in, in all the provinces in Canada, Johnny MacDonald, the late 19th century is, uh, is uh, presented to students when they're 12 years old or 13 years old. And uh, they don't understand that. I mean, try to understand, you know, the politics of the United Province of Canada in 1864. I mean, it's, nothing is more boring. Yeah. <laughs> um, his accomplishments were administrative. He did not win great wars. He did not, you know, he, he, it's not, pres even though we, you and I can appreciate the very significant accomplishments of the man in a context that is, that is difficult. That kind of stuff is not, is, is not material for a 12 year old, 13 year old. Mm -hmm. So, but that's it. That's what they get. Uh, the name McDonald doesn't come up in political speeches. Uh, you know, it's just it just doesn't ever come up. So in a context like that, when somebody says Johnny McDonald was evil, well, people say, well, maybe he was. I never studied it. I don't understand it. Maybe, maybe, maybe so. You know, if the mayor of Hamilton or if the mayor of Kingston says Johnny McDonald was evil, or the mayor of Montreal, well, you know, well, who am okay. I to say? I've but, never studied this. I would but, take time. But this is all part of this nonsensical trend where people don't do their homework and no. intelligently look at the history. And I know there's always healthy debate around these things. But let's be clear. You've got places like, um, well, Queen's University changing the, the name of MacDonald Hall. Uh, uh, the, our first prime minister who played an incredible role in the establishment of that university, let alone its law school. Shame on them. You've got um, the, the, uh, the taking down of Sir Johnny MacDonald statues, as you referenced. Shame yes. on them. Um, these these um, officials not doing their homework. And then you have McMaster University yes. uh, apologizing for celebrating Sir Johnny MacDonald's birthday. And they, they evidently don't study their history. And these are the people in charge educating yes. our citizens. Why, as a taxpayer, would ever we fund these places is beyond me. Well, and, you know, we have a conservative government in Ontario that allows this. Um, this is this is a shocking thing. It's, so it's, so it's, these, uh, the, the, the question is, where is Doug Ford? Where is the whole lot of them? They're all missing in action. This is this is reprehensible. I think so. I think we should be, you know, again, take things from the beginning, uh, reintroduce John A. MacDonald uh, to elementary school, talk about John A. MacDonald in high school when it matters, talk about the founding of Canada. In high school right now, um, and there are only three provinces that require a Canadian history credit to graduate in high school, um, most of the West does not require this. You know, we have an approach where you start Canadian history in 1911 or after the First World War. No, I mean, we should be introducing adolescents to the real history of Canada from 1867 and, you know, encouraging them to have a reasoned discussion of the failures of the country, but also of its successes through the 19th century, through the 20th century and through our century. We need to take this seriously and it, we will not have reform of, of our attitude towards John A. or of Wilfrid Laurier or any prime minister or any government until we take seriously the task of teaching our adolescents. This is critical. And I, I think that any reform at trying to change minds, you know, is going to fail because our population simply does not know John A. Macdonald. So we need to get things going on that front. And, you know, shows like this one are an important part of that. Hopefully people will say, hey, you know what, I, I didn't realize all this and maybe I should learn up, learn learn more about it. And there are books on John A. Macdonald out there that you can read, including mine. Um, but there are a lot of things out there, uh, good and bad, reasoned, some less reasoned, but there's a lot of stuff out there on Sir John A. Macdonald. And I think as Canadians, we have a duty to to uh, to inform ourselves of of those things, and not just John A, but all of our history, because it is being slagged. Because we are being we are presenting ourselves and presenting to our kids a version of Canadian history that is simply false. We have well enormous things to be proud of as a civilization in in North America, and uh, that can only be understood in the context of history. Well so unless we do that, we're just going to fail. You're right on. So if you had to recommend how citizens could um, be part of this uh, popular revival of history, what would you recommend we as citizens do to kind of bone up our history? I know that I've just thoroughly enjoyed as a, as a young child reading uh, Pierre Burton's uh, popular history, uh, yes. history books and series. I thought that was very uh, fascinating. 
What would you recommend, uh, Patrice? Well, you know, Pierre Burton is still read, uh, read and uh, I still treasure Pierre Burton. I think his history was accurate and fun and, and lively and, and inspiring. Uh, since then, we've had other books on John A. MacDonald, uh, just to name a few. Jed Martin wrote a small biography, a short biography, very accessible on John A. MacDonald. Mm -hmm. Richard Gwynn published a massive two-volume uh, biography of John A. MacDonald, uh, a lot more detailed. Again, uh, a journalist perspective. It's very lively. It's character driven. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of fun. It's very accurate. Uh, I, I like it a lot. I think that Richard Gwynn did a wonderful job. Jed Martin uh, is a professor, a little bit more serious, a little bit more attentive to context, but it's in a short book and it's very digestible and fun. I've contributed my own. Uh, you mentioned at the outset, uh, Sir John A. MacDonald at 200. It's a collection Excellent of essays book. from a bunch of scholars. Uh, taking a hard look at John A. MacDonald in terms of Indigenous uh, the population, in terms of um, his accomplishments, in terms of his failures, mm -hmm. um, his racism, all those things. Serious, attentive, scholarly uh, presentations of MacDonald. So you have a gamut out there that is easily accessible. Um, but, you know, you say, what can we do? Well, we can also talk to the school principals who have named, renamed John A. MacDonald schools in favor of, 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 of nonsense, of, of obscure things that nobody understands. Mm -hmm. How, again, how did provincial governments allow this to happen? Um, I think you should be writing letters to your MLA or to your MPP. Um, you know, this should not be happening. Renaming streets. I think we should be honoring John A. MacDonald with a street uh, in his honor uh, across the country. Every town should have a Sir John A. MacDonald street. Uh, um, but, you know, I think we're a way off there. We're, we're, it's going to be a while before we, we can accomplish that. Well, well said, uh, Patrice. I'm, I, um, I would definitely, uh, quote, vote for you when it comes to uh, <laughs> reinvigorating our history. And, and I think that's the point is that we live in an incredible country from coast yeah. to coast to coast. And part of it is through our history. And we need to understand through kind of a balanced assessment the good, bad, and the ugly of our history. But nonetheless, it took incredible vision. Yep. And that vision is really reflected in a stunning fashion in the personal and political history and story of Sir John A. Macdonald, our first prime minister. And we should be proud of that. And well, if we David, don't know our history, we do not know. If it's not based on facts and evidence, we don't know our history, nor do we know our identity. And if we don't know that, how do we pursue a vigorous future? based on a vision for today. I agree with you. You know, it was Wilfrid Laurier in his eulogy to Sir John A. Macdonald who said that the history of Canada is the history of Sir John A. So if you appreciate what Canada is today, you have to appreciate what Sir John A. did for the country. And this came from a contemporary and a bitter adversary. That's something to remember. So well said. So thank you so much, uh, Dr. My Patrice pleasure. Dussil, for joining us. It was a pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you very much for having me. Thank you for watching Leaders on the Frontier. We're a nonpartisan think tank. We explore ideas, policy, and practical solutions that can make a difference in the lives of Canadians. We do not accept any government funding. We work for you. Thank you for supporting Frontier. Visit fcpp.org to give. While you're there, be sure to check out our latest articles and research. Without open discussion and debate, you're not thinking, nor are you free comment below. We'd love for you to join the conversation.